Hey gang, I am Joe Wettelman and welcome to The Last Frame Live. Uh, having a little sound issue tonight, you should be able to hear me fine, but it may sound just a tad different. I'm on a different microphone, my apologies. Tonight, um, <laughs> I'm running a few minutes late here, but we're going to do this. I see there's a couple questions in already, so those of you that are here and are regulars, help me out. Give me some more questions. Let's, let's solve some problems tonight, right? The Q&A is always my favorite part, and it's always the part where we have the biggest impact. And of course, folks, if you're watching live, you know the drill. Please let me know you're here. Leave me a message in the chat. Let me know where you're tuning in from also. And of course, if you're watching the replay, no worries. Drop a comment below the video so that I know you are here. Uh, gosh, already we got a lot of people here. Mike is here from uh, Montreal. I got Robert in the UK. Uh, Jay in Southern Colorado. Joe in Michigan. David in San Diego. Ty in Seattle. Seattle? Ty, isn't that the wrong coast? Uh, Cooley in Indiana. Lynn in New York. Alan in Denmark. All of you, part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame each week. And for that, I appreciate you, and I'll work really hard to help you with your photography tonight. Of course, it would help a lot more people learn about The Last Frame if you could do me a solid. Hit that thumbs up below the video. That way, YouTube shares it with more photographers, and they find out what we're doing here. And of course, while you're down there, feel free Go ahead and hit that share button and let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube right now. Okay, so um, crazy week. That's my excuse. All it is, I had a sick puppy for the last two weeks. He had surgery, six surgeries, six sets of stitches, but he came through it. He got his coon off yesterday. Life is starting to return to normal. Uh, spent some time today booking flights for upcoming trip to Austin, Texas. Uh, that's going to be on June 1st and 2nd at Precision Camera for their Photo Expo. I was hoping to be able to share links with you today, but it hasn't gone live on their site yet. It's going live this weekend. So next week, I'll share all the details so that you can sign up. The best part of it is it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. On Thursday, June 1st, I'll be doing a presentation called, this is my favorite presentation title, don't be afraid to suck if you want to improve your photography. Yes, that's the title. And you know what makes this talk even cooler than the title? I get to use Dr. Seuss to teach you how to be a better photographer. It is my favorite photography talk. And then on Friday, June 2nd in the afternoon, I think it's at 2 or 2.45, I'm going to be doing a presentation all about the beauty and fashion portraits that I do. And then we're going to do a live demo. We're going to have a model, a makeup artist, and we're going to do a bunch of really cool stuff using those really neat Nanlite Pavo tubes, the RGB ones with all the colors and that going to have a lot of fun with that. And we're going to do that right in the middle of their store. It's a huge store, but we're going to do it in the store. So uh, it should be a lot of fun. Also, my monthly presentations that I have been doing coming up on May 9th, no rules competition or competition yet. Composition, super important difference there. No rules composition techniques for you to improve your photography. Uh, basically, the bottom line is like, look, you know, rules of composition were not made for creative people. They just weren't. And please, folks, don't be that photographer that thinks you know your stuff and tells a new photographer or a young photographer, hey, you need to learn the rules to break the rules. No, you don't. That's the biggest bunch of crap that's ever been spouted anywhere. So I would encourage you, check this talk out. It's a very practical approach. Uh, and honestly, it's a really simple approach. Like anything else in photography, it takes some practice. You got to turn it into a habit. But believe me, the process and the priorities really very, very simple. Okay. All right. So let me just switch a screen over here really quick. I was just reading an article this afternoon before I got started with all this. It's uh, on Petapixel. It's called Sony tricked DSLR makers into thinking that mirrorless was not a threat. It's basically how they convinced Canon and Nikon that mirrorless really wasn't going to work out. <laughs> Jokes on Canon and Nikon, right? 
Um, anyway, so a couple questions that are in here. Uh, let's see from Mike, Canadian Source Rex. In fact, let me go ahead and dump that on the screen there. Joe, I have a problem that I need solving. Okay, first, my idea is I want to do a triptych shot of a person blowing uh, a bubblegum bubble. I want to get three shots, one peak bubble, uh, two bubble burst, and three the aftermath. And then Mike goes on to ask, I'm not sure if the ring light would work to light the person. Uh, he then also goes on to say, also, I don't really want to have to buy any new lights. Uh, yeah, that's never really the answer unless you've got a client that's going to pay you a whole bunch of money. Okay. And then his last comment with this here is he has three Yangwano uh, YN563 speed lights, one Godox S. Um, is that I or 160 uh, and a cheap 12 inch ring light? I know the speed lights won't work. I'm planning on using the SI 16 to 48 inch oxy box for the white background. So, so first of all, Mike, I, I don't know why the speed lights won't work, man. Um, not gonna lie, like to me. So here's here's why I think the the, the speed lights are the way to go and the speed lights would totally be my first choice out of all the stuff you listed. So actually let's take it backwards. You asked about using a ring light. So, you know, ring lights get a bad rap and that's mainly because of the way people use them, not because of the ring light. Right. Uh, in my world, you know, my world, my head, scary place for some, but in my world, a ring light is a specialty light, meaning it's cool to have. I have several different ring lights, the traditional LED ones that you think of, but I also have a flash ring light. I have the Godox ring light, which I love. It's awesome. But you notice you don't see me do lots of images with them, right? And, and that's because when you use them the way that they were designed to be used, meaning the lazy way. And the only reason I call it lazy is because we see people that will, you know, get a ring light. And then, of course, everything they do, you know, the faces in the middle of the ring light. And, you know, if they're wearing glasses, you see the big circles. If it's close ups of their eyes, um, you know, you see the circle catch lights and the lights the same. It gets boring after a while. Right. Um, so that's why I call them, you know, kind of specialty lights or novelty lights, honestly. Right. Um, but since you're talking about bursting a bubble, you want to be able to stop some action, right? So the problem that you have with those essentially inexpensive, um, ring lights, see, you get their either LEDs or they have the CFL tubes that go around them. They're not that bright. So you're going to, and look, I'm the guy that says, hey, it's okay to raise your ISO. And it is, but you're going to have to raise your ISO quite a bit in order to get a nice fast shutter speed. Because if you want to try and stop a bubble mid pop, right, then you want to be working at a minimum of a thousandth of a second, better yet, quite a bit higher. So if you work with the speed lights, the speed, and, and you don't need, Burst mode, by the way, Mike. So, so let's take one thing at a time, right? Um, he went on to ask here, will the speed lights uh, work with the burst mode on a camera? So take a big step back. So first of all, Mike, I got to tell you, I got to give you this little piece of advice. Um, both your camera and your speed lights have these things called manuals. Um, also for both your speed lights and your cameras, you can go to YouTube, type in the speed light or type in the camera and probably also add the phrase burst mode and you'll find lots of information on how they work. Okay. Uh, but here's the thing. Don't shoot burst mode because you're not going to get the picture. Let that sink in for a minute. Cause I know a lot of people are like, ah, well then how the hell else am I going to get it? Okay. <laughs> You're going to get it with technique. That's how you're going to get it. So first of all, you're thinking, you're thinking about shooting the image the wrong way. So you've got three images, bubble big, bubble popping, aftermath. Those are the three images, right? 
Nothing says that you have to shoot him. No, not at all. Because when you see the trip take at the end, you can't tell the difference, right? So person blows a big bubble, click once, flash, there's that picture. Then they blow a little bit bigger, pop, pop, there's the second picture. And then the aftermath is gonna be there for a few seconds. Plenty of time for the flash recycle. There's the third picture. So believe me, and, and look, there's a whole composite section on my website. There's a whole album of composites where I've got, you know, multiple image shots of people doing stuff and they're not bang, 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 right? They're taking seconds apart, letting the strobes recycle because you can and because that way you have more control, right? So you're going to set your camera up on a tripod, first of all, okay? And you're going to set the person in a spot where they're not going to move. And, and since you're doing this intentionally, you're going to let the person know, look, look, when the, when the bubble pops, it's all over your face. Don't be like, ah. you know, just you're going to tell them, keep your spot, keep looking at the camera, right? It's that simple. The biggest challenge you have and burst mode is not going to solve this problem. The biggest challenge you have, it is going to take several attempts, possibly many attempts at popping the bubble to get the best pop and the best aftermath, right? You're not going to do that all in one fell swoop. You're just not. And by the way, once you get the best pop, if it happens to make the best aftermath, that aftermath will sit there for a second. Plenty of time for your flash to recycle. Just make sure when you start the project, you've got full power, full power batteries in it, right? If you're setting your lights a little bit closer to your subject, you will be able to work at fairly low powers on the flash. So you're going to be able to speed up your recycle times at the same time, okay? Um, but the flash duration is much faster than the shutter speeds that we were talking about. So the flash in and of itself is going to stop the action for you. You don't need a, a burst mode because what you're trying to photograph is actually not, so listen closely because I'm about to talk in two directions, right? What you're trying to photograph is not fast action in terms of your subject moving, right? So it's not fast action in the way that we think of, you know, it's gonna happen so fast and, and I gotta get all these pictures in a split second. No, you don't actually. Because the three, the three pictures you're talking about, it's actually very easy to put time between them. Just enough time for your flash to recycle. Mike just typed in here, okay, I was overthinking. And yeah, and you know what, Mike? Here's the bet, wow, that gets big. It's amazing how that works. Um, yes, you were overthinking it, but honestly, that's not a bad thing. It really is not. I'm not trying to let you off the hook now. Um, you know, the way that you start to solve problems as a photographer and the way that you learn these things is, you know, you, you come up with a solution in your head and then you try it. Sometimes the solution is great and it worked. Other times it completely sucks. But once it sucks, you've now got an idea and experience and a failure. And so now you're one step further down the path through like, okay, so how do I solve this failure? What part of what I did, you know, led to this failure and, and what should I change? Right? So, so that's, that's not bad at all. But honestly, for me, uh, it's three separate pictures taken moments apart, plenty of time for the flashes to recycle. And granted, speed lights compared to a studio strobe require a little bit more time to recycle, but there's nothing about this triptych idea that you have that uh, would, would prevent you from giving them uh, enough time to recycle. So that's, that's how I would do it. Uh, and then you mentioned here, in fact, let me go back because I want to get the right information. You mentioned that you have a modifier, uh, a 48 inch Octobox. So um, the way that I would do it is I would light your subject with a 48 inch Octobox because that's going to give you a really nice light you know, a little bit off to one side, not too far, right? But a little bit off to one side, that way you're going to get a little shape on the face, okay? And then take the other two speed lights that you have, and if you want the background to be completely white, then 
use a white wall or a white backdrop and use those two speed lights, one on either side, aimed at the wall to get nice even light on the wall, right? Um, to me, that would be the best use of your, um, of your three lights that you have, okay? All right, and so let's see. Uh, where is it here? Any camera works. James from Anchorage. I uh, just want to say hi that I've been practicing still life photography. Cool. Uh, and I believe it might be my niche. That's awesome, James. Very cool. Um, very cool. And scrolling on down here. Cool is here. Um, let's see. What's your opinion on Seconic, the Seconic meter with the built-in controls for uh, the 8200 and 8600? Uh, I think it's awesome. Um, it's kind of on my maybe gas list because uh, I don't need it, need it. I've worked without a light meter in a studio for 20 years now, best part of 20 years. Um, but it's the first kind of combo setup that has gotten me thinking, hey, this would be really nice. And part of what I particularly like about this setup, so do understand that if you go with that, you need the new X-Pro2 trigger from Godox, right? Um, if you want to be able to use all of the features that come with the module that goes into the Sikonic meter. Uh, the original X-Pro, you can use that as a pass-through and it'll fire, but if you want all the controls, that they're advertising, you need that X-Pro2 trigger, the new one, which is, you know, very reasonably priced, just like the previous Godox triggers. Uh, that meter is expensive, though. It's best part of 500 bucks, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the idea of being able to control everything from the meter uh, and even being able to kind of do a similar uh, setup to what Profoto does, where, you know, you can start out in TTL, and basically figure out what your, your powers and your exposure settings are and then just lock it. And at that point, you, you're switching over to manual uh, for the lighting and it locks everything in place. Uh, it, definitely really nice. You know, I think that ultimately if I was shooting all day, every day, um, then, you know, and, and especially working in various locations, then I would be all over that in a heartbeat. Um, given that the majority of my work is, you know, in my studio scenario, or even when I'm out doing demos, right, when I'm teaching, uh, I tend to work in that 10-foot circle, right, for the stuff that I'm teaching. So it's not uh, as big a need, but um, I've had a chance to play with one. Uh, very impressed. Uh, works incredibly well um, and definitely, um, you know, definitely a, a, a great piece of gear. So, Okay. All right, let's see here. Um, what do we got? Uh, I think I missed one, but we'll go back from Barry. What is your opinion on UV filters left on lenses all the time? Um, <laughs> the only reason I'm, I'm pausing there, Barry, I, I have an opinion. It's been changing of late. I won't lie. Um, it's definitely one of those things that has become such a stupid debate on the internet. Okay. So I think, you know, if you, if you're asking me because you've caught on with a stupid debate and you're trying to figure out who's right, who's wrong. Um, or if you're just legitimately curious because somewhere along the way you were taught, Hey, you should be doing that. And you're just wondering if that's still the case. So here's the deal, right? Let's go backwards and look at a little bit of history, and then we can make a lot more sense of um, how you should decide whether or not you should be using a UV filter on your lens, okay? Um, because I'd be the first to tell you straight up, don't let somebody else tell you. Um, I will give you some criteria if you do want to use one that will help you, but don't let somebody else decide for you. So, it, you know, historically, if we go back actually to when I started photography in, in the, the early 70s, right? Lenses were not of the quality that they are now. And specifically what I mean is not just the build quality. It's the build quality, If like if you bought a Nikon lens, uh, the build quality was really, 
pretty doggone good, right? Anybody that's walking around with some of those old Nikkor lenses from the, the 70s and 80s, they're, they're, those things are beasts. They're built like a tank, right? But the glass, that was the problem. And it's not that the glass was bad, but the processes used on the glass were very different. In fact, it wasn't until 1984 that Tamron, now here comes Joe's useless knowledge, you know, trivia database here, right? Uh, it was 1984, Tamron filed for the patent for the coding process that is in use for pretty much every lens made today. Every Canon lens, every Nikon lens, every Sony lens, every Tamron lens, every Sigma lens, they all pay a little bit of money to Tamron for the patent, for the way that elements are coded, specifically the front element. Uh, and you can find a lot more information about that on, on Tamron's website, actually. Tamron Japan, the, the main website. You can, you can find the whole history behind that. So, um, and that continues to get better, right? You know, the manufacturing processes we have for lenses uh, are obviously so much better, even in 1986 when, when they filed for that patent. Um, so that impacts every element in the lens. Uh, certainly, if you folks were following me when I was an Olympus ambassador, I routinely would walk onto a stage or walk in front of a group of people and take a spray bottle full of water and spray it all over my camera and my lens element with no filter and then just wipe off the front of the lens with my finger and take pictures, right? Uh, and this was great. Lens was never damaged. Um, no problem whatsoever because the lenses were weather sealed and water spraying on them, no big deal whatsoever, right? So I, for years, was a photographer who stuck with what I was taught in the 1970s. And that was, yes, put a UV filter. In fact, I'm so damn old. When I first started photography, UV filters weren't what you put in front of your camera. You put on skylight filters. So for some of you that are old enough, that just triggered, okay? Uh, and then um, UV filters came around and UV filters became kind of the standard because the skylight filter really was pretty much a piece of glass, right? UV filter actually did help a little bit um, with um, removing haze and things like that. So it had a little bit more of a useful purpose. But uh, yeah, back then you protected your lenses. Plus, remember, I started as a newspaper photographer. So I was slinging two cameras on my shoulders and they were getting banged and hit, and, you know. So yeah, lenses or filters several times saved the lens for me. Um, fast forward, you know, here we are now in 2023. Um, for most of the, what, seven or eight years that I used Olympus gear, um, I had filters on my lenses, except for when I was doing those demos, because I would take them off to do the demos. Um, I did, however, start to run into a problem. And this wasn't a problem that was uniquely Olympus. This is a problem I've been able to replicate with both Sony lenses and Tamron lenses. And that is that part of the problem with lenses getting so good today and because I like to use wide angle lenses when, you know, when I'm not shooting my portraits and my people pictures, or even for that matter, you know what, when I'm shooting the people pictures, when I do that backlit stuff where there's a lot of light coming straight into the lens, I would run into problems from time to time where I would pretty much wipe out the contrast in my shot because what was happening, light was coming through the filter, bouncing off that coating on the front of the lens and lighting up the inside of the filter which was dramatically reducing the contrast in the shot, oftentimes creating like a haze. So I had to remove the filter and then problem solved, right? So there were times where, yes, I was setting up a shot and realized like, my God, this looks like crap. And then, ah, it's like, wait, that light's really close to the camera, uh, field of view, pull the filter off, problem solved, right? So, um, and keep in mind too, like, you know, when I was shooting as an Olympus ambassador, I, I won't lie, I never had a problem with the lenses, but I also had the peace of mind of knowing, well, okay, like if I destroy one of these, you know, they're going to, they're going to help me out. Right. So now here I am with Tamron. I paid for my Tamron lenses. They're out of my bank account. Uh, I did buy filters for all of my Tamron lenses. 
um, my 70 to 180, which is my primary work lens, my portrait lens. Um, I actually don't have the filter on it now, and I don't put a filter on it unless it's leaving my studio. If it's leaving my studio, I put a filter on. And my philosophy is the filter stays on unless I'm creating a shot and the filter is causing flare in the wrong direction, right? And then I'll remove it, but otherwise the filter stays on. Beyond that, all my other lenses um, have filters and I still use them. But here's the thing. So this may be part of the deciding factor for you. And I, sorry that this was a really, really long answer, Barry, but all these pieces now are really important. If you are going to use a UV filter today, don't buy the $10 UV filter. That's kind of really crazy, right? Um, if you're going to use a UV filter, you're going to spend 100 bucks or so, and you're going to get a really thin, really high-quality coated filter. And as a result, yes, that's, you know, take every lens you have and add like an extra $100 to the cost because that's essentially what you're going to wind up paying for a good high quality UV filter. So, um, do you, is it like in the old days where you need them on all the time? I don't know that you do, but I do think it's very important to be honest with yourself about how do you use your gear. If you are really careful with your gear, I, and look, mistakes can happen anytime, anywhere to anybody, right? I, I mean, just keep it real. But if you are really careful with your gear, uh, can you get away with, you know, out of UV filter in today's world? Yeah. But then if, you know, if you're going to go someplace where it might get dinged around, banged around, be honest with yourself and then maybe put it on, right, for that purpose. Um, but if you're a person that tends to be a little sloppy with the way you handle gear, then, yeah, UV filter is still a really good idea and can wind up saving you um, a lot of money. Um, you know, same time, you know, because, and part of the thing, let's just say that you don't have a UV filter on, by the way. And you go out and you're going to photograph a big mountain range. So there's going to be haze in that scene, right? But but you weren't anticipating it. You didn't think you were going anywhere near mountains. You wind up near mountains and now here's this really cool shot, but there's a lot of haze. Well, so there's a couple things. Number one, the lenses alone today will do a better job with that haze than they would have 20 years ago. They're not perfect. They're not going to remove it all, but they will do better than the lenses did 20 years ago, right? But at the same time today, we have software, right? You go into Photoshop, and there's a dehaze slider or Lightroom, and there's a dehaze slider. And that's going to take that blue haze, and it's going to knock out a lot of it. Now, is it perfect? No, but neither is a UV filter. Right? So, unfortunately, not an easy answer, Barry. It comes down to kind of weighing all those different elements. But I would advise you, if you're going to use a UV, UV filter, use a really, really good one, super high quality. So that's going to be thin glass that's coated which means it's going to be expensive. Um, and, and yeah, if it's a matter of there's just that occasional need for it, um, then, you know, if it's not a protection need, if it's just the actual UV aspect, then there's always the dehaze filter because that's essentially what that's doing, right? Okay, so let's see here. Let's go back. What was the one that I, I needed? Uh, oh, from Cooley. Would you use Smug Mug for your website? No, maybe kind of, sort of, for part of it. <laughs> so, um, Smug Mug's a great platform. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Smug Mug, you can build a, a photography website on Smug Mug, but they also have the, um, the setup built in where you can upload digital files and set it up so people can come and order pictures, right? And they can pay you for digital downloads or they can pay you for prints. And what's cool, like with Smug Mug, they're affiliated with Bay Photo out in San Francisco. So let's say you sell an 8x10 print. They'll tell you, hey, the cost of that 8x10 print is $2.50. So you can set the price at $25. Somebody comes in, pays the $25. Smug Mug takes the file, sends it to Bay Photo, deducts the $2.50 and sends you all the profit. And then Bay Photo prints the photograph and ships it to the client because the client also pays for the shipping and checkout, right? So that sounds really, really awesome. So there's a couple things to understand. Number one, um, the first warning that I have to give any photographer asking me that question is understand if you really want to make money in photography, you are not going to make money selling your pictures that way. 
in-person sales, that's how you make money. Now, look, there are always exceptions and there are always business models that don't fit in-person sales. Okay, so if that's the case, fine. But you just got to be honest with yourself, man. If you're being lazy, you're also not making money, right? If there's the opportunity to do in-person sales, but you just don't like having to talk to people and you think, oh, I'm not a good salesperson and, and I can't do high-pressure sales, whiny, 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 then, yeah, you're just making a choice to not make a whole lot of money, right? So that being said, though, here's why I went so wishy-washy on the answer, Coley. I find, so this is big part of my opinion, this piece right here. I find the templates that SmugMug offers for website design to be boring, predictable, and they look like everything that you find on SmugMug and Pixie Set and Zenfolio and Squarespace, meaning not super attractive. And while you can customize all of those, every one of those brands that I mentioned, including Squarespace, you can customize them. Um, they're all kind of clunky, to, to be honest with you, okay, to, to try and customize them. It's really hard to make your site look different than everybody else's, okay? Um, and when I say different, I don't mean like whiz-bang creative with stuff flying around. Or, no, 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 no. I just mean to, to really kind of give it your own flavor. Um, a lot of photographers that I know actually build two websites. Now, don't panic, gang. This actually isn't a whole lot more work than what you're going to do building one. But they'll use a company like SlickPick or Format or one of those kind of companies to build their website, their front-facing brochure website. In other words, the website that is intended for people to find it on the internet and say, oh, I didn't know about this photographer. I really like their work. I want to contact them. It's that website. It's the brochure website. And that's the one that's going to have your portfolio. It's going to have your about page. It's going to have a contact form. Uh, and maybe it has a services page. That's it, right? And then they, in addition, they will then have a second website with a company like SmugMug that is where they upload their images for people to go and buy prints. Now, if you're a marketing person, you understand what branding is. And branding is the idea that you want to create a look and a feel that people recognize you right away. So the problem that you have then is, well, you're working with two different companies, two different websites, and they may not look exactly the same. Well, it's really easy to use the same colors. It's really easy to put the same logo on both. And remember, the people that are coming to the Smug Mug site, if you do this two website plan, they're already your customer. They have already found you. In fact, you have already photographed them. They are coming there to look at their proofs. So that website doesn't have to be unique. That website doesn't have to be different. In fact, that website needs to be simple and easy for them to navigate and easy for them to understand so that they can look through their pictures and make the selections that they want, right? So, yeah, I mean, my my sincere recommendation is if you want to have a great website and you also want to sell images online, I would put them at two completely different web addresses, right? Because let's face it, if somebody is coming to your website for the first time and they're looking for a portrait photographer, wedding photographer, whatever, right? and then you've got this whole section where people can, you know, look through the thumbnails to find their pictures, Look, we all know the reality of it is, is not every job that we shoot is portfolio worthy. It's just not, right? So you don't want your potential clients to be aware of that. Even if you're going to put stuff behind a password, you usually have like a thumbnail picture, right? So yeah, you, you want to keep those things completely separate at completely different addresses. I mean, you could set the Smug Mug set, uh, site up as a subdomain of your website. So in other words, you know, your website, it'd be like joeedelman.com, uh, www.joeedelman.com, but then the uh, Proust website would be no www. It would be proust.joeedelman.com. That's a subdomain, okay? Um, that's how I would use them. So SmugMug, they are great if you want to do, you know, online sales and print ordering, Cooley. Um, Equally, I will tell you, uh, Pixie Set and Zenfolio, also 
very good for those purposes, right? Um, but I'm just not a fan of their um, their actual websites as far as their marketing websites. Um, honestly, if I had to choose between just for the marketing website, okay. If I had to choose between Smug Mug and Squarespace, I can't believe I'd say this, but I'd probably go between with Squarespace only because uh, there's much, much more that you can do with a website um, than you you can with Smug Mug. So um, that's kind of how I would approach it. Okay. Uh, Mike had a follow up question here. What gum makes the best bubbles? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I probably go with good old fashioned, isn't it like actually called bubble gum? I don't know, Utah, I don't blow bubbles, but um, I'd be willing to bet you, Mike, that if you Googled that, um, you would probably find plenty of information for that. So um, let's see. A Alexandros, thank you for your comments uh, about uh, being unique and helping people. Uh, you appreciate that I'm precise and to the point where you're trying to convey to others. I, I sincerely appreciate that. Thank you. Um, let's see from Nick. Nick, how we doing? Uh, I need to set up a green screen for work from home. Uh, pull it down from the ceiling. Need better than the built-in inversion on Zoom. Um, are you doing that with A10 Mini Pro as a hardware solution? Um, whoa. Okay, Nick. I, you don't need an A10 Mini Pro to do a, a green screen with Zoom, okay? Uh, to do a nice green screen with Zoom. So, um, let me let me get these in an order that's going to help. So, first off, let's talk about green screen for a second, right? Part of the reason that the Zoom green screen sucks is two things. Step one is that most people don't actually have a green screen. They just turn the feature on. And, and Zoom tells you you can do that. And it does... It does an uh, impressively good job, but yeah, you can tell, right? Uh, and depending on your background and you move and add, it's like, it's horrible. It's actually, it's a distraction. So yes, if you're going to do any kind of green screen, you actually do need a green screen. Now, once you get the green screen, here's the A number one mistake that people make. And no amount of hardware, no amount of software is going to fix this. So start here before you start looking at hardware. And that is... That green screen has to be lit evenly. And when I say lit evenly, I am not exaggerating. I mean evenly. Like if you were to take a light meter and measure, you know, corner to corner, in the middles, all around, it's going to be exactly the same everywhere. The more even your green screen is lit, the less work the software has to do. So actually when I did all of my backgrounds in a green screen. This is not a green screen. This is an actual wall that's behind me. But when I did all of mine, yeah, I'm going to hold this up to the camera, let the camera refocus, Nick. I use this app. It's called Green Screener, right? Uh, it's on an iPhone. I don't know if it's available for Android. You'll have to check that out. But um, with this app, basically, when you hit start, you uh, it'll want access to your camera, and then you aim it at your green screen, which I don't have a green screen here to aim it at. But what it's going to do, it's going to kind of um, map the, the tonal ranges of the light. So very simply, you've got to get it down to one tone. So it's almost like a game, like, you know, like doing a video game. It's like work your lights until you get it completely even. If you do that, then Zoom, the software, Zoom, will do an awesome job with the green screen and in zoom you can upload your own background and um all that kind of stuff so i will tell oh there you go i i oh gosh i hope i'm saying him aula i'm sorry if i got it wrong uh it says yes it's available for android and it saved a lot of stress over five years and indeed it does anytime i've got to do a green screen i'm pulling that app out and it's awesome it's just you know super super easy and the best part of it is if you get that thing completely clean you know that you're going to have a super easy time in post or if you're using the Zoom software in real time or even like since I'm a Mac guy, um, the software that I use for my live stream is called Ecamm Live. I could have it do the green screening right in the software 
Um, but again, the key is the cleaner the green screen, the easier it is for the software to do it and the better the job it does, right? So, so honestly, you know, A10 Mini Pro, Nick, all that is is a switcher. Yes, you can green screen out of that, but at the end of the day, understand that um, what, it's what they call keying, where you remove the green background and add in another background. That's a software function, not a hardware function, right? So yes, um, A10 Mini with a piece of software that's called A10 Software Control, which actually I have open on my screen right now for the sake of my audio, which tonight is not going through the, the ATEM, unfortunately, because I had a battery die right before I came on. Um, that's why my audio sounds a little bit different tonight. You're hearing me actually through the MacBook. But normally, I have that open when I'm live streaming, and it's reading the audio. Um, yeah, reading the audio. Uh, it's reading the audio from the mic and everything and, and putting that through the live stream software. But that's the software that does the keying for the A10 Mini Pro. Uh, beyond that, the A10 Mini Pro is a switcher. It allows you to switch between multiple cameras. So, uh, you know, if you're using it for um, work from home um, stuff, Nick, where, and I happen to know Nick's an attorney. So, like, if, if you're, you know, obviously needing to do client meetings and things like that, but have a clean, professional looking background, uh, and that A10 Mini is really not going to do you much good. Um, you're better off to work with software. And actually another comment which I really made, which is very, very true. Uh, another important thing to get right is, uh, whoops, let me get that back on the screen if I can here. Is it gonna come up or not? Let's try that one more time. There we go. Um, get the right shade of green. Some of the cheap green backgrounds are too bright. So yeah, you buy a cheap green screen, that's gonna cause you a problem. In fact, hang on one second. So let me do really quick. I want to type something into Google, uh, and I want to be able to give you ah, perfect. Okay, no, that's not it. Son of a gun. Uh, hang on, one thing here. That's what it was. Okay, so the absolute best kind of green screen is not paper and it's not thin material it's foam backed material so I'm gonna hold this up to can I don't know if I'll be able to get the camera to focus on this or not but we're gonna try uh, let's see if I can get it to focus on it so you got if you see the edge this is kind of thick right so it's green screen it's actually got a little texture to it right but this stuff is this is what they use in Hollywood so when you see like the behind the scenes, um, you know, of motion pictures and there's like massive walls and that that are green screen and then they're going to turn into buildings and all that. This is the stuff they use because it can be stretched out and um, you do have like where this crease is, right? I would have to steam it to make that come out because you're not supposed to fold this stuff. This is just a, a, a clipping that I have off a roll. But you can buy this from the company that makes it for Hollywood. Um, let me switch over and I'll share a link with you guys. This is a company that's called Chroma Key. So you can get it like pre-cut in different sizes. They will make custom sizes. When the pandemic hit and I started live streaming um, in what is actually a guest bedroom in my house before I set up here in my office, I had a custom one made that basically fit the, the framing of my shot perfectly. But um, I'll share this with you. This company was great to work with. Um, Super quick on the turnaround, uh, the quality was great, all that good stuff. Um, but if you want the absolute best quality green screen, that's it. But understand that the best quality green screen is of no value to you if you don't light it evenly. Can't stress that enough. And believe me, that is, that is lessons that were learned the hard way. Um, especially, you know, doing like Final Cut Pro and, and trying to, to key out the green screens and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it was just brutal. And, and even with live streaming, if, you're, if your screen's not lit evenly, 
that means you have to be more aggressive with the software. But then when you're more aggressive with the software, it starts to mess with your overall image. And yeah, it's just, it's a nightmare. You get that background lit evenly and it's like plug and play. Turn everything on? No. But um, I will tell you for the stuff you're looking at doing, Nick, if you light the green screen properly, Zoom will actually do a great job. Um, but it, it needs a, an evenly lit green screen. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Do I got everything? I think I got all the questions. Go on, you guys got nothing else? Uh, if you had nothing else, I got something I can rant about for a second. But uh, let me just see here. I want to make sure I didn't, didn't miss anything. Um, yeah, this is actually, it's a, it's a physically painted wall. Um, the aperture is a sticker. Uh, from Fathead, you guys, uh, if you're in the United States, you probably know what Fathead is. They have all like the the athlete cutouts that you can get, you stick them on the wall. Well, they do custom ones. So um, that the aperture I had made it Fathead. So that's actually, I mean, to give you a sense of just how big that is, it's like so it's quite a bit of you know size to it, um, and then. Um, down to my right here is a um, Savage um, light panel that I have, which I can change the colors on, you know, just push button if I want um, and switch those up. The orange all the way on the edge of the frame is actually from a, a room light that I have that just happens to give me a tungsten light. And then there's one other blue light up to the side, which is constantly blue. but. Uh, so yeah, that's a physical, and the wall is painted um, black. It's not a pure black, but it's a really um, close to black. Black, okay. Um, all right. Now here's an interesting question. I was John. I was just talking about this with my um, Tog Knowledge community folks right before I came on here tonight. Have I played with Camera Raw's new denoise feature? No, because I don't have it yet. Uh, apparently, and tell me if you've got it in Camera Raw, John, apparently it's in Lightroom, which I, obviously that runs off of Camera Raw, but, um, according to my Photoshop, I am running the latest version of Camera Raw, uh, but I do not have it yet. Um, so I, uh, I, I will certainly play with it when it comes out. Uh, for me, I know this would... <laughs> This statement will frustrate a lot of people, but it's not a feature that I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. I just don't have a problem with noise. Um, and, and look, I don't just shoot, you know, in, in the studio, right? I, I uh, you know, like a lot of this, like even just Little League Baseball stuff, shooting with my, my grandkids, um, heavy overcast evenings, I'm routinely shooting at much higher ISOs. Uh, now, when I say much higher, uh, 6,000, 8,000, um, you know, even 12,000 ISO. Um, and when you're properly exposing, the key word there being properly exposing an image with today's cameras, um, the noise isn't that bad. Um, I'll do a little bit of noise adjustment in the current camera raw settings, but... Um, yeah, I mean, for a lot of people, it's a factor. So I think it's cool. You know, any new feature that we get, if it works, that's awesome. Um, but sadly, when it comes to a lot of the denoising stuff that gets done, uh, it's because people aren't shooting at, at decent exposures. A and or because people are pixel peeping their images, right? And, and understand that, you know, now this is going to change, by the way. As, as AI continues to get better and better and better and more powerful and more powerful and computational photography continues to improve. But, you know, for the most part, the way that, that you know, denoising and all that stuff has been done is, you know, there's um, a, a certain amount of, you know, blurring that happens and then, you know, kind of resharpening. And, yeah, to me, the image is just never the same. So I, I try to avoid it. I come, you know, I guess because I'm old school, right? I, I was taught one of the very first things when I bought my first camera and started learning about photography is that, you know, photo comes from the Latin for light. And, you know, it means that we need light to take pictures. 
So I'm not afraid to create light uh, or find light. And, and I'm not trying to be a smart ass, but I'm just being honest. Like I rarely have a situation where noise is a problem for me. Certainly in the early 2000s, like I still remember, you know, shooting it at ISO 400 or God forbid ISO 640 or 800 with the Nikon D1 or a D1X or a D1H. And yes, to this day, I still have PTSD from that experience, right? Because it was horrible. But those days are long gone, right? Long gone. Um, I, you know, e even when I'm pushing my tolerance level for ISO, um, as long as I'm properly exposing the file, that's the key, properly exposing the file. And properly exposing the file doesn't mean getting everything lined up in the camera. Properly exposing the file means understanding how your camera is going to read a scene and understanding what are the potential problems in that scene given the lack of light that exists and given how you want the picture to look and then exposing for the sweet spot. The sweet spot being how are you going to take what's there or not there and get the most quality out of your frame. Right? That's where the foundational skill set of photography comes in. Right? That's, that's, that's what photographers do. You know, and, and we did that in the film days because in the film days you, you had you know, none of this dynamic range stuff. You had a little bit of um, uh, latitude is what it was referred to, right? But not much. Um, so, yeah, proper social. Yeah, good luck, Nick. No, I'm not going to do an ETTL rant. Um, but I have nothing against ETTL and I have nothing against ETTR unless you're doing it all the time. And then that's just dumbass. You can quote me on that, okay? Um, so, uh, Joe's photographer, will you do the image breakdown on the image for YouTube tonight? I apologize, Joe, but I'm not. One, because I'm almost out of time, and two, because of rushing to get my community meetup in. I did not get it queued up. Um, so I will do that one next week, plus a new one next week. I owe you guys two, um, and, and I will do two of them next week, I promise, okay? Um, so, uh, but yeah, John, to go back to the denoise thing, uh, I'll definitely check it out. Um, so yeah, in fact, one of the things that I, I want to try and show you guys next week, I showed it to my, my community group tonight, and they were less than impressed. Uh, you, you want to talk about a group of underwhelmed people. But um, you know, it's kind of a lesson that, that I learned, um, a, a twofold lesson, two layers that I learned in the last week. Um, this past weekend was opening day for uh, Little League for both of my grandsons. The one is playing a game called Quick Ball, which is like a, it's an alternative to T-Ball. And then the other one is in his third year of Little League, right? So um, I shoot all their games and, and the league, I do pictures for the league just to keep them happy. So I always have access to the games and that. So I shot their opening day stuff and that. So I processed well over 500 images this, this past weekend between two games and the opening day. And I stumbled on a feature that's been in Photoshop for a while now. So obviously it's in Adobe Camera Raw, which means it's also in Lightroom, right? Um, but it has to do with, you know, uh, subject selection and background selection, sky selection, where you basically click the button, does it, right? Um, and it was kind of a big wake-up call because I'll, I'll tell you what I do now, which is just amazing. And it's one of those things that given that that technology exists, this thing that I'm talking about, it's kind of so obvious, it's stupid to not do it, but I'll get to that. Next week, I'll show you all. Um, but the moral is, though, this software that we're using, I don't care what brand. These cameras that we're using, I don't care what brand. This stuff is moving so fast into the future, and that's awesome. Like, I love it. But you know what? You got to work a little bit harder to really keep up. So with this ma these masking tools in Adobe Camera Raw, I, especially in my studio work, I don't have need for any of those tools. But with Little League, for the last two years now, I've been using the face masking, the automatic face masking tool, because a lot of times, you know, if the kid's wearing a batting helmet or if it's an overcast day, especially like if they've got like white baseball pants on, then, you know, the brightest part of the image is the white baseball pants and the kid's face is in shade and it just doesn't make for a really pleasing image. So I would automatically 
select the face with a little bit of feather to it, use the shadow slider, bring up the face, and it really gave the images pop. Awesome. So for years, one of the things that I do in this studio, and I do it both with my lighting, but also with my post-production, and I've talked to many of you about it before, is I work to always make sure that the face is the brightest part of the image. Unless, of course, it's a bright white background, right? But if it's a color background, that I want that face to be the brightest part of the image, or I at least want it to be slightly brighter than the rest of the image. So for whatever reason, this past weekend when I started processing the images, I had one, and it was just kind of bugging me a little bit. The background was a little busier than I would ideally like, but the kid had this amazing expression. It was from the opening day ceremonies. It's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them this image, but it was bugging me that it was just a little bit busy, right? So I've never tried the automatic background selection. I clicked out automatic background selection, and in this busy image, it picks out the kid who is the subject and masks this kid perfectly. So I'm like, wow, okay, that's impressive. And then I grab the exposure slider for the background now and drop it down about 20 to minus 20, minus 25. And it's so subtle that if you hadn't seen the before, you wouldn't know that it's done. But it's just enough to bring that kid forward in the image. And then the slightly busy background is not a bother. Because be forewarned, if you go try this, if you go too far, it starts to look like you took a pair of scissors and cut your subject out and pasted them on top. Don't do that, right? So the idea is to make it cognitively subtle, not obvious, right? That's the key. So I started doing it on more and more images as I was prepping all these images and got to the point where I was doing it on every single image. Because all, especially by the time I got to the game images, you know, it's mostly like one or two kids in the shot. And it was a very overcast weekend, so nothing fancy about the lighting. The lighting was kind of blah. So just by hitting that button, selecting the background, and then just darkening that background ever so slightly, it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. So as I'm doing this, of course, I'm all excited, like, oh, I've got a new tool in my toolkit. But it's also that reality of realizing that feature's been there probably for at least a year, maybe two years. I don't remember, because I never had a need for it. So I didn't pay any attention to it. My mistake. So I share that with you only to say, look, it's no different for me than it is for you or for anybody else. It's hard to keep up with all this stuff, right? It really is. And especially if it's something that you're not going to use or that you're not necessarily going to need for uh, a lot of your stuff, right? So it's kind of one of those things. Keep an eye on it. Nick, you're right. You can pick the person and then invert it. Uh, I found that just by putting a, a little bit of um, a feather on it, and again, my my goal is to only darken the background slightly because here's the thing, it, it's I guarantee all of you, if you go try it, you go too far, it starts to look super fake, super fast. It just doesn't work. So the key to this is it's finding that tipping point, right? You take it up to the tipping point where you manage to get that little bump that brings your subject out, but I promise you, you go you go as much as minus two past that tipping point, and it honestly just looks like crap. So be forewarned for those of you, if you try it, and I went through that this weekend. If you decide you like it and you start doing it, be careful because you're going to do it for a little while, and then you're going to walk away from some images, and you're going to come back and you're going to be like, whoa, I overdid it. And I did the same thing with the baseball pictures, right? There were pictures that I sent to the league from the opening day ceremonies, that when I looked at them a day later, it's like, yeah, I clearly got a little carried away. They put them on social media, right? They're thrilled. They're not going to care. But I go back and I look at them and I'm like, yeah, I got a little carried away on those. So by the time I, I did all the images from the baseball games, which were later in the weekend, I had a lot more control over it where I was, you know, also using a lot more discipline, which again, makes all the difference in the world. So before, and that's a very common thing. It's like when it's a new thing, we kind of use it and overuse it, right? And honestly, that's the way that I look at it. It's your brain. It's your brain kind of figuring out where are the boundaries, right? What's your number? So if you want to start with my numbers, my numbers are like minus 20, minus 25 on, on exposure for the background, right? When I use the mask. Um, that's just, you know, it's, it's like when you watch the cooking shows and they're putting the seasoning on flavor to taste. Okay, so you may want less, you may want more, but just be forewarned, if you go too much, it immediately starts to look 
fake. Like once you hit that tipping point, it just starts to look kind of ridiculous. It looks like you pasted your subject on top of the background and, and that's not going to work. The idea is for it to be as natural as possible, for, but for it to give your subject that little bit of extra pop. And it is amazing how incredibly accurate it is. And when it misses, like if it misses part of the background of that, you just add a brush and loosely draw it in. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect because we're not going dramatic, right? So next week, I promise, I'll share it. I'll show all of you. Um, maybe, maybe some of the YouTube folks will be more impressed than the folks I showed it to tonight. But I think it's an awesome technique. I will definitely be using it a lot. But that said, folks, um, time for me to roll. I appreciate all of you coming out. We'll be back to Wednesday night next week. There are a couple nights over the next two months, a couple of Wednesday nights, where we will be off by a night. Uh, and I'll tell you completely honestly, it's because of baseball. I don't miss a baseball game for my grandkids. The little one had a game last night. That's where I was. Um, so whenever they're playing on Wednesday nights, I'll be switching to a Tuesday or a Thursday. But beyond that, we will be here next week. Uh, remember on your way out, hitting a thumbs up helps other people find out about the show. And look, as always, I know it gets old, but you don't get back the days that you waste. So please go pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot. Adios, gang. Have a great week. Take care.